Hi guys, I hope you're doing really well. My name is Sarah and welcome to What The Horror, the channel where we talk about horror movies old and new. As you will have seen from the thumbnail and the title, today we are talking about the newly released Blumhouse instalment, Imaginary. I'll be honest, I knew very little about this film going into it. I tend not to look too deeply into films anymore. I figure I'm gonna cover them on the channel, so I will just rock up and give it a go. I did check out some of the trailer when I did my horror movies coming out in 2024, but I tried not to watch too much of that. And I haven't looked too much into the director or the cast. I just knew that it was going to be an early release of 2024. I knew that it was produced by Blumhouse and I knew based off of the poster and the trailer that I had seen we were probably going to be treading ground a lot more like Night Swim or FNAF or other films along those lines where they're a PG-13 or a 15 in the UK where you're expecting a few tropes, a few jump scares and nothing that really pushes the boundary. However, the release of Megan last year has taught me that sometimes going in with lower expectations, expecting this to be a gimmick, can actually have that twisted back on you and you can be so pleasantly surprised by something of better quality than you were imagining. So I did go into this thinking, okay, I'll give it a go. I'm not gonna write it off because it's an early release and I'll just see what happens. So I finished watching the film maybe two hours ago and I'm still ruminating and processing my thoughts on the film. However, I did come out of it sitting firmly on the fence, kind of a 50-50. There were things that I liked about the film and there were things that I didn't like about the film. And as always, I do try to find the positives even in things that I don't like that much. But I'll be honest, you know, even though I'm on that fence of yes, there's good and there's bad, I'm kind of leaning more towards there's more bad. But we'll get into that in the review. So Imaginary was directed by Jeff Wadlow. He also produced it along with Jason Blum, the head of Blumhouse Productions. Jeff Wadlow has previously directed Truth or Dare and Fantasy Island and Cry Wolf, which I've not actually seen. When Jessica moves back into her childhood home with her family, her youngest stepdaughter Alice develops an eerie attachment to a stuffed bear named Chauncey that she finds in the basement. Alice starts playing games with Chauncey that begin playful and become increasingly sinister. As Alice's behaviour becomes more and more concerning, Jessica intervenes only to realise Chauncey is much more than the stuffed toy bear she believed him to be. Okay, so this is going to be a spoiler-free review. It's not going to be a particularly deep dive review. Uh, it's just going to be sharing my thoughts on it, trying to stay positive, but highlighting some of the negatives as well. Uh, so if you haven't seen the film yet, then you can use this as a guide for if maybe you're weighing up whether you're going to go see it or not. Because let's be honest, with the way things are at the moment, things are expensive. Going to the theatre is a luxury. And with so many wonderful films constantly being released, sometimes we need a little bit of help to know which is worth spending our money on and which is perhaps worth waiting until it is on a streaming platform. Now with Imaginary, in terms of the story, in terms of the idea behind it and the plot, I have to say that this is a pretty good idea. This is a pretty strong idea. It's that a woman's imaginary friend from her childhood comes back and is now her stepdaughter's imaginary friend. I mean, there is something quite sinister or something that you can make sinister in the idea of children imagining these friends that their other friends or other parents can't see, but there is this bond between them. You know, you could make that into a fantastic horror film. You could make such wonderful mythology and folklore behind it about it being a creature or an entity that latches onto children or, you know, the origins of it. So I really, really like the concept of the story. I think that that is a strength in the film. And I will say that in some ways, Imaginary does deliver quite well on that. There are some developments in the plot, some reveals in the plot that I think work well, that they have delivered effectively. But as with Night Swim, I feel that this is a potentially fantastic premise that missed the mark. So while they did deliver and execute some things really, really well, they also dropped the ball on so many other aspects of it. And I was left 
wanting. I was left wanting more. So as far as characters go, we have the setup of husband and wife, newly married, but the wife is a stepmother to two children from a previous marriage. The stepmom is played by Dewanda Weiss. She plays Jessica. Uh, we have her husband played by Tom Payne, known from The Walking Dead. He played Jesus. So in this, he plays Max. He appears for a duration, a little bit of time to show up to be this character and then is conveniently shipped off somewhere else so that it is the women of the story, the stepmom and the stepdaughters who are experiencing it. This isn't really a spoiler, I feel. This is quite a common setup and concept. You have the wider range of characters who are conveniently got rid of, so it can be our core characters who actually experience the story. And then we have the two daughters played by Tegan Burns and Piper Braun. They play Taylor, who is about 15, and Alice, who is about, I would guess, about eight. Um, I would say the little girl playing Alice is perhaps not as spectacular as the young girl who was in the boogeyman or the boogeyman I never know which way to say that uh, from last year she also played Leia in the Kenobi TV series um, so I think that she did it she did an okay job and I'll be honest she got a few laughs out of our audience she was quite hoity she was um, quite attitudinal at times but it just was never quite as good as some child actors out there. Um, the delivery of Dewanda Weiss, I think that she did okay as the stepmom, as Jessica. Uh, Tom Payne felt like he was there for the paycheck. I'm gonna be honest, you know, he does a really good job as Jesus in The Walking Dead, but in this, it just felt like he rocked up, fulfilled his schedule scheduled shoot days, got his paycheck and was out of there. There was no real connection between him and the daughters. There was no real connection between him and his wife. And there was no real connection between him and the audience. I have to be honest. One main criticism of the characters that I have to say is that we are dealing with cookie cutter stereotypes. You have the stepmom role who in days gone by would be the evil role but now it's that she's misunderstood and can't connect with the kids and it's that kind of journey you have the husband who is just kind of there he's a dad he's a husband but he's not as engaged as he should be you've got the older daughter who is the typical angsty moody one who keeps lashing out she doesn't want to have a relationship with the stepmom you have the younger child who is quite sweet and is more open to things. That's what makes her more vulnerable and susceptible to the villain of the story, to the imaginary friend. But it goes further than that because you even have a boy next door who, he's not the boyfriend role, but he's kind of a love interest for the older daughter, Taylor. And he comes in and he's just so unlikable. I mean, he does it, just one visit to this house. He does multiple things that are so disgusting and so unlikable. And I just thought, oh, okay, well, they're building us up to dislike this character. We have the token character who is gonna do the exposition dump and knows more about the situation than our leads. We have a old woman character who lives in the neighborhood. This woman, she is where we get our exposition dump from. She is where we get our explanation from. So yeah, you're kind of there with a character checklist just ticking them off. And I think another thing that didn't help the characters was the dialogue used. There are some instances in this film of lazy writing of revisiting those particular tropes of processing through trauma, developing relationships, growing through uh, the experiences that they have together, explaining a particular part of the story. Yeah, some of the dialogue was a little weak, a little cringy, a little predictable, and everything in this film was over explained. So for example, a character would do something or would grow and develop. And rather than the audience being left to understand that, you would have another character going, oh, hey, audience, by the way, if you didn't realize this is what this thing meant. And I, I feel like I've said this about another film recently. Maybe it was Night Swim, maybe it wasn't. I don't think it was Night Swim, but there was a film I watched recently where it felt like everything was so over explained to the audience. And while some audiences will need that, 
I don't think you need it for the entirety of your film and I don't think you need it uh, as egregiously as we had an imaginary. Some dialogue was quite nice and there were some parts of the story, just pulling it back to the story, that were quite nice. There were some parts that were quite emotive and emotional and worked in a much more effective way than others and I'll be honest, those moments were not the horror. Those moments were the moments between family members, between family dynamics. So some of it was good, some of it was adequate it's just that some of it didn't work and when the dialogue didn't work or the story elements didn't work that's where the characters suffered and it you know it's not even like the characters were that unlikable they were just generic beige cookie cutter and it was a shame because there were there were glimmers there were moments of me actually liking the lead character of jessica this aspect of her being very artistic um and you know sort of the the dynamic between her and the the stepdaughters her drive to be a stepmom it just some of it worked quite well and that's it makes it a little disappointing that there were moments of yeah you know what that was that was good that was fine um so i've been dragged down by the weaker bits okay so in terms of villain of the film like i said when i was talking about the story i think that the premise of this is really good i love the idea of making a villain out of an imaginary friend i mean we've had villains out of possessed dolls of um, leprechauns of bigfoot of all sorts so you know why not imaginary friends but if you are creating a world, if you are creating a villain and a lore mythology to go with that villain, I feel like the basic requirement of the writer or the basic thing I would expect of the writer is to know the world that they're creating and know the villain that they're creating as well. And there were parts of this film where the villain just wasn't really expanded on or explained as well as it could be. And I don't mean going back and giving us an over the top, fully in depth origin story and explanation for everything, but just the stuff that they do give us, the explanation they do give us, make sure that that makes sense. Because to be honest with you, when we were getting the explanation from the character who gives us the exposition dump, I thought, great, this could be quite exciting. We're talking about um, folklore and traditions and we're talking about different cultures but really everything that we were being told was a little bit confused and didn't fully make sense there was no fully ex uh, full explanation as to the villain as an entity and its motives and how it's defeated and anything really and that's where the premise failed for me because I feel like oh there's so much you could do with this so much and they just didn't I mean they tried to and we got a little bit but it just felt like even the creators of the film were confused by their own villain the scares in the film we are talking about generic jump scares so if that is what you like if you like signposted jump scares then this film has got you covered there is one bit that i did quite like where they did subvert your expectations of a jump scare and i appreciated that because if you are self-aware enough to know that you're going down route one jump scares you know you've got the standard build up to it if you want to have a little bit of fun and play around with that i do appreciate that so there was one moment where i thought okay fair enough Enough. we're doing something a little bit different um, but apart from that I wouldn't personally say that this is a scary film but I watch a lot of horror films if you are watching this review and you merely dip your toe into horror you could still find this quite scary um, there are you know ominous moments where things are dark and shadowy and there's things lurking in the background and and you see something and you think did I just see that you know and the camera pans back and it's gone so not generally scary you know typical jump scares but you know there's one or two moments that are passable and i will say <laughs> the soundtrack in this is actually quite a good soundtrack but it feels as though someone has put it over the wrong film there were moments to me of almost straight up comedy where 
you're listening to this soundtrack where everything's really serious and really scary and they're trying to set the scene and something scary happens and this scary music is playing and the camera will cut over to the bear and the bear's face has changed so he's got like the frowny eyebrows and he's gr like he's crabby he's like this grumpy bear and i just think that is such a juxtaposition and then there's another scene where the setting is like a tea party and it's all ribbons and frills and crowns and tiaras and everything's so fun and childlike and yet it has this really scary music playing over it and I appreciate the music and the visuals are not bad but it just feels like the two don't really gel together and so there were a few times where I was watching this film and I did laugh and I don't think I was supposed to. But talking of laughing, my audience, there were a few people in it that laughed a couple of times at things that the little girl said, Alice, and the other characters said and so, you know, they laughed at bits I didn't so I think there, there is something for people in there. I was laughing at the bits you weren't supposed to laugh at, um, but it, I wasn't laughing at it in a cruel way. I was still trying to laugh with the film. I was like, oh, okay, that's that's quite hammy, or that's a bit tongue in cheek. And so, you know, laughing or not, that, that was still a level of enjoyment for me. So my overall thoughts on the film, it sounds like I've been very, very negative. And yeah, perhaps I have been, but my point is this is a film with such an exciting premise that I think they could have done so much with and to a point they do some quite good stuff. There are some reveals and twists around the premise of the imaginary friend that worked really really well but then there were some other bits that didn't at all and they reverted to lazy tropes and writing techniques and so it's that frustration of this could have been incredible and it didn't quite get to that standard but there were people in the audience that did seem to enjoy it they were laughing they were going oh and you know there was a couple of people jumping so this leads me on to my next point that whilst i don't think this film was for me personally there is certainly a market and an audience out there for this film this is not going to be a terrible terrible film uh, for everybody this is a film that i think is perfectly marketed and manufactured for that audience of teenagers or you know late teens early 20s friends going out for something to do a young couple going out for a date, people who dip their toe into horror, people who want a horror film but just aren't as well versed and seasoned in it. I think that is the audience for this film and I really wish I could think of examples off the top of my head but I can't, I'm pulling nothing. This is not a film I think for highly seasoned horror audiences, people who want a genuine scare, people who want something a little bit different, people who want something that is going to challenge them or really subvert their expectations or really give them something to take away and, and chew over. I think this is for a more mainstream audience and this is an audience that need horror films as well. We don't necessarily need ones like Midsummer or Barbarian every single time there is a release. It is okay to cater to the wider audience if us as horror fans don't really want it. Now I suppose some people could disagree with that and think well we shouldn't settle for anything than you know brilliant but I have said before on this channel that it is okay for a film to just be okay. It doesn't have to be the best thing ever and it doesn't have to be the worst thing ever. That isn't how we live our lives. We don't live in the extremes, we live in that middle bit that we're okay it's fine, it's average. And that's that's just the truth of it. So it's okay if a film is released that is just okay, but might potentially be wonderful to somebody else, to a different type of audience. So I would say if you're watching this and you're a dedicated horror fan, might not be for you. If you're watching this and you dip your toe into horror or you don't like anything too extreme, you like your horrors to be um, rated 15 or PG-13, then this could well be for you. I don't personally think this was as bad as Night Swim from January. There were some bits in this that I liked visually, there were bits in this that I liked in the sound design, and I've got to be honest, you know, we have accepted films like Child's Play with the Chucky doll, so why can we not accept a film 
with Chauncey the bear, the imaginary friend. Because honestly, this scabby looking bear with his little velvet red waistcoat and his grumpy little face, there's something actually quite sweet and endearing about him. So those are my thoughts on imaginary. Overall, I would say maybe wait until this is on streaming or video on demand as the theatre is quite expensive. I personally don't think that it is worth going out and seeing it at the theatre, but you know, I don't want to tell you what to do. Do make up your own mind, but this is just what I'm saying. I think it's not a rush out and watch it. It's a, you can wait a few months to see it, but still give it a try because there's still a fun element to it. I haven't actually, as of right now, logged it on Letterboxd. So my rating of this film is as big a surprise to me as it is to you. But if you follow me on Letterboxd after I've done this video, I will be logging it with a star rating and a review. Um, so you can go check that out as well. But my gut instinct is that I'm leaning towards a two and a half star. I've seen some reviews that are a half a star, a one star, one and a half. I think that's a little cruel, but you know, we all have different opinions. I think I'm leaning towards a two and a half. If you're new here and found me through this review, then please do uh, consider subscribing and joining the What The Horror family. There are plenty more movie reviews to watch as well as a extensive back catalogue of episodes. And if you did enjoy this review, then give it a thumbs up because it helps the channel. And if you would like to join these names here and gain extra content, then I will leave a link to my Patreon page down in the description box below. But in the meantime, thank you as always for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves and I will talk to you in the next episode. Bye.